All right. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Thanks, Laurel and Bruce. Um, I'm Kristen Body. I'm the membership and events manager here at the Asheville Art Museum. I want to thank you all for being here for today's member program. Today is a special program um, that will include the screening of all the possibilities, reflections on a painting by Vernon Pratt, and a conversation with the co-directors of the film, Louis Cherry and Marsha Gordon, as well as William Dodge, director of the Vernon Pratt Project. Uh, this documentary film focuses on a work by Vernon Pratt that was completed in 1982. And Marsha and Lewis have actually produced other documentaries about art and architecture related subjects. I'll post links to some of their other projects in the chat box in just a bit, so you can watch those at your leisure. Um, but before I turn this over to Marsha and Lewis to give a brief introduction, I just wanna go over some housekeeping for all our attendees. First, just note that all microphones are muted by default. We are recording today's program, so if you prefer not to be recorded, please just make sure that your video remains off. Uh, you'll see red lines through your microphone and camera symbols at the bottom left of your screen to indicate that they're off. We will post a recording of this program on the museum's YouTube channel tomorrow, but only those in attendance today will get to view the film as it will be removed from the recording. And if you would like to ask a question or make a comment, please type it into the chat box. I encourage you to enter those as we go. After the film, we'll hear a brief presentation from William before we open it up for some Q&A. Um, and finally, I will send out an evaluation to all attendees after the program concludes. The information you provide um, through these evaluations is important for the museum when we apply for grants or are reporting on programs. So please do take a few minutes out of your day to complete it. Um, and last, I do just wanna mention that this is our final member program of the year and what a great one to end on. Um, I wanna thank you all for participating in them over the past few months. This is something we came up with once COVID hit and we've had such a great response from all of you that we do plan to continue these programs in the new year um, and many of our other virtual programs going forward. However, this has been a difficult year for for the museum as it has for many nonprofits, and we hope we can count on all of you to help us continue serving our community with wonderful programs like this one. Um, there is still time to participate in our COVID relief fund and matching challenge before the end of the year. Any gift to the annual fund, upgraded or new memberships will be matched dollar for dollar by a longtime foundation supporter. And now I will stop sharing my screen. I encourage you to put your screen on speaker view as we welcome Lewis Cherry and Marsha Gordon. Hello, everyone. Hello. Thank you so much for tuning in today um, and uh, for taking some time out of your day to learn a little bit more about Vernon Pratt. Um, this is our first showing of this film outside of the film festival circuit. We've been in about 20 film festivals so far from New York City to Hot Springs, Arkansas, to La Ciotat, France, and Sheffield, England. And, um, and it's been a really interesting experience to uh, try to circulate Vernon Pratt and his work to a larger audience. Um, when we were first approached uh, and asked if we would consider doing a documentary about this painting and about Pratt, um, it didn't take long for us to realize that this was a great creative challenge um, to make a documentary about a very large scale, very complicated painting that had never been exhibited before um, by a painter, uh, an artist who very few people, especially outside of North Carolina know about was just a, um, that was an exciting opportunity to put our heads together and figure out how to do this. And um, this also came to us, we decided to do this project one week or so before the exhibition came down. So we did not have months to shoot it. So um, we had to kick into high gear fairly quickly thanks to a team of really wonderful uh, collaborators. So we had more leisure to shoot our interviews, which you'll see in the documentary, but um, we felt very fortunate that we even had the little time that we had to shoot the work in place. Um, one of the things that we really wanted to do with this project was to develop a formal structure um, in terms of our approach to the film so that in some ways it was honoring Vernon Pratt's um, incredibly interesting and intellectual approach to this painting and to all of his work in our documentary. And so, um, for example, 
The documentary is 16 minutes and 16 seconds long. That was not an accident. I can assure you after you see the documentary and understand a little bit more about the work, you'll understand why. Um, but we wanted to keep the film also somewhat short and concise. You could easily do a 45 minute or an hour long or a 90 minute documentary about Vernon Pratt, but we really wanted to distill it down to this one painting and just enough context about Pratt so that you can understand it. So this is a, this is a difficult painting to approach in any context and particularly not actually seeing it in person. Uh, it's, it's very large and it's very small at the same time. It's actually, uh, it looks completely different from different uh, di viewing distances. And so, so how to represent it was, was a real challenge. Um, and at the same time, the painting is super simple. It's about filling in squares, but it's extremely like mind bogglingly complex as a, as a work, the way it was applied. And so as we were deciding how to represent the work, we, we really felt it was important to represent a conceptual framework. And so really what our film is about is to sort of lead the viewers in a, a journey of discovering this painting, discovering how Vernon Pratt is thinking about making a painting like this. And then as the painting is sort of revealed over the course of the, of the film. So we hope that you enjoy the screening and we look forward to your questions um, after the screening and after William's presentation. It's kind of was mentioned in the, in the film, uh, my name is William Dodge, I'm the uh, founder and director of Vernon Pratt Project, which basically just means uh, a big Vernon Pratt nerd, essentially, uh, <laughs> and uh, enthusiastic about it. And in 2016, uh, kind of through a series of kind of um, random conversations, I actually ran into Marsha and Lewis at a holiday party and we started talking and I was with another friend and we started talking about this opportunity that had come up where there was a there was an adopt a painting uh, event by an artist I'd never heard of, Vernon Pratt. And uh, we did a little bit of kind of digging and all the all the work I could find of his online actually I really didn't like at all, which I thought was pretty interesting. <laughs> but when I was talking to Marsha and Lewis and my friend Craig Dean and others, they were like, man, this, this guy's work is amazing. You really should check it out. And uh, so we ended up, we we sent an email to his daughter. This is an uh, adopt a painting event. And this was in October, 2016. And we were given these really vague directions. Like nobody was really sure where we were going. It wouldn't even, the directions, the place where we were going wouldn't even actually come up on your, on your uh, actual navigation. So it basically sent you a MapQuest link. And it was this 764 through 802 Ellis Road. Um, this even MapQuest didn't even know exactly where it was. And where we found ourselves were basically these old tobacco warehouses, building number 44 uh, to be exact. And again, like my wife and my wife Shelly and I and my friend Craig and a bunch of other people, we went to this thinking we might find a small painting, like it's a normal painting. Uh, that we might be okay to, 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 to purchase and, and come home with. What, what we found was a completely different scenario. Um, these column bays are probably about 15 feet wide. Um, and when, we, when Roger says hundreds, if not thousands of pieces of art, there were thousands of pieces of art. I mean, we still have probably several hundred pieces of art in our possession. We've given away a ton of it since then. And, and I should mention too, um, I'll kind of get more into the story in a second, but you know, all the stuff that I'm going to show you today, more or less, was stuff that was left over and basically destined for the trash, uh, which is pretty interesting. There's a couple of pictures of the warehouse. Um, the painting on the right, right here, is the Gramercy. That's in the Gregg Museum's uh, permanent collection, and I want to say it's eight or nine feet tall to give people an example of scale. And this painting is about 18 feet long, so you can kind of start to get a sense of scale. This entire warehouse is full of art. But this painting is 18 feet long and there's one column bay. Think about how big that, think about how much work there was to actually go around. And I started thinking, I was like, you know, I was completely, both my wife and I, and basically everybody there were completely caught off guard by this. We'd never heard of this person. I have an undergrad in art history. I'm, 
North Carolina design enthusiast and art enthusiast and never, never really knew who this guy was. And I was trying to figure out, you know, who is this mystery person? And more kind of we dug into it, we realized, you know, he was represented by a major New York gallery, the OK Harris Gallery in Soho. You know, he had been written up in the New York Times. And he had exhibited all over the world, including having a one-man solo show at the North Carolina Museum of Art. I mean, Caravaggio and <laughs> Ansel Adams have one-man shows at the North Carolina Museum of Art. It's a big deal. Why haven't I never heard of this person? And also to Vernon, did, Vernon along with George Ann Eubanks, who spoke in the, the film, they did the largest piece of public art in North Carolina history, uh, the North Carolina Education Wall, which uh, it's on Halifax Mall in downtown Raleigh. It's interesting because a lot of his work is so focused on math and kind of systematic abstraction that even he kind of started to look at it in his own notes. Kind of through our work, we ended up, you know, with hundreds and hundreds of paintings, et cetera, and drawings. But we also, to me, I think the most interesting thing of it all is we ended up with all his journals and diaries dating, basically documented in his entire process, every museum show he ever had, every gallery show he ever had from the 60s all the way into the mid 80s. And so I'll just kind of flip through and show you a bunch of slides of different work. And this, again, this was work that was left for, in the trash. This is a, it was interesting, I should point out too, in, in 2017, uh, Vernon Pratt had two concurrent solo shows the exact same time, Western Carolina University's Fine Art Museum had one called Grids and Gradients, and then the one that the film is based on. This is a 25 foot long a piece of paper that was stored in an unconditioned warehouse for 20 years, and, or if not more than that, actually it's from the 80s, so 40 years almost, still in perfect condition. It was destined for the trash. Uh, you, know, some of the, you start to see the scale of some of this work when you start looking at the doors. It's interesting because, you know, the painting that is featured in the film, that's, that's 256 panels. These are individual pieces. The painting's about 20 feet long. You can see my dog and my wife and our friend Brian for scale. And these are major paintings of storage. Again, all of this stuff was destined for the trash. When we, when we went to the warehouse, uh, we ended up coming away basically with a ridiculous amount of art we hadn't planned to purchase, um, but it was, we, we felt fortunate to have that opportunity. There were two adopt a painting events. There was another one in December. And because we felt like we had gotten more than our fair share by, by any means, we decided we were gonna try and get the word out and help his daughter Trinity spread the word about the art because basically they've been storing this work for 20 years or 18 years or whatever. Um, and they just couldn't, simply couldn't afford to do it anymore. They lost their mom to cancer. They just needed to kind of close this chapter and they wanted to try and find the art good homes. But at the end of the day, they needed to clean out their warehouse and whatever they couldn't clean out the warehouse. It just, it is what it is. And so we, we made every effort to try and get as many people to this warehouse, second adopt a painting warehouse event as possible. Tell everybody, you know, this works amazing. Come bring the biggest truck you could possibly bring. So we're talking moving trucks. People showed up with little, you know, SUVs. Really, you, you don't I realize how big these these paintings are. And uh, remember, Trinity, his Vernon's daughter, looked at my wife, and when uh, when it became apparent that not all the work was going to be taken, and she looked at Shelly, and she started crying, and she's like, "All this work's going to end up in the trash." And it was interesting because obviously we're passionate about it, but I'm trained as an architect. Most of my clients are municipalities or universities, most of which have museums associated with them. So I started thinking like, how like, might we be able to take on some of this so it doesn't, you know, fall into basically the landfill. It started to spread the gospel, right? And to find, get these, some of these pieces in good hands. You know, start to look at, now I mentioned in the, in the documentary, Vernon Saw Color, and this is actually important for you guys to know because you have such a strong connection to Black Mountain College, but he saw color basically as formulas uh, and mathematical kind of formulas where one was absolute white, 1,025 was absolute black. And he would use this in order to create a systematic abstraction. So this is the formula for the grammar C, which is shown here. And it's some of his notes. And through this effort, we ended up kind of meeting some really amazing people we would have never met otherwise. You know, this is 100% volunteer. There's no money in it. It's, if anything, you're, you're just pouring money into it rather than more money and time. 
But through this, we got to meet a lot of really passionate people and see a lot of this work um, end up going some pretty incredible places. And you can you can see on this painting in particular, in this this image in particular, it's basically all the possibilities of filling in four. So it's white and black, and these are all the unique possibilities in there. And so what he would do is he would layer different layers of paint, and through that kind of opacity, it would create a different shade. And so what he would do is look at maths, color formulas. This is a painting called All the Possibilities of uh, uh, Black and White and Zero to Eight Coats. It's 256 panels, and you can start to see some of the different, um, different orientations to set it up. So just kind of wanted to kind of go through and show you guys a, a wide array of the different types of work that he had, from drawings to you know large scale work, but you know small scale to this painting's 35 feet long. It's not actually damaged. It's an amazing condition. It just needs to be stretched. It's 35 feet long. I mean, like no wonder. You know, I say in the documentary, like nobody does a painting that big and expect it to actually find a good home. And that was one part of the problem is some of these things are just so massive. It's been interesting to kind of see um, different people start to get involved and through kind of some of our efforts and through some of the poor, <laughs> poor bastards we've roped into our, <laughs> into, uh, our work is, is really been pretty interesting where we have and people from all different walks of life and completely different geographies from all over the world that email and are really excited about this kind of work. And uh, you know, a lot of these paintings I'm showing you have ended up in museums. This is this went to the Weatherspoon um, Museum at UNC Greensboro, and then obviously some of the work needs restoration. And we ended up meeting really amazing art restorers to help it make that happen. And kind of through these efforts, we've again is we've really found. Uh, fellow enthusiasts who've uh, really helped to make these, these things possible. Uh, would, would say that the documentary is specifically about the first ever complete showing of that painting. He did show it at least once before and he noticed that it says some of all the possibilities of filling in 16th. And in interestingly enough, the painting on the left, it's got a 25 cent price tag on it. That's in Asheville Art Museum's permanent collection. And it's 15 foot by nine foot painting at um, Duke, Duke University's brand new $120 million Rubenstein Art Center to you know, finding random Vernon Pratt stuff that wasn't even associated with the warehouse in Charlottesville, Virginia and convincing my buddy to spend a day and carry several thousands of red granite to deliver on the front porch at the Gregg Museum. And they just told us, and we asked, they said if there was an alarm code or anything, just said, just leave it there. Nobody's gonna mess with it, it's too heavy. And so we've just been going around giving, basically trying to give away paintings as much as we can uh, to help preserve his legacy. Uh, this quote was pretty interesting. It says, the biggest mistake of modern art is a perception or assumption that it is a mystery. And then he says, the assumption of a virgin may be a mystery, but good art is always obvious, which I always thought was pretty interesting. But one thing I wanted to point out is this is a labor of love by many people involved. Obviously, you see Marsha is my wife and several other friends here. And, you know, special people like Keith Isaacs and Marsha and Lewis and our friend Brian Hoffman that have really helped to make this stuff happen. And uh, I would, would want to point out Greg McPherson, a former uh, former uh, co-worker of many of you at Asheville Art Museum. It was the first museum person I convinced. Went in cold call, had a conversation with him, convinced him to drive six hours the next day to dig through my basement with me for five hours. They took 11 things for the permanent collection. And I would say Greg is standing in front of um, all of four eighths, which is in your permanent collection, which is a really major all the possibilities painting, as well as Falling Light Corrected, which is the painting that's in yours permanent collection. And ultimately, you know, ultimately we just saw the documentary about this particular project or this particular painting, but it is important to know one last time that Vernon never saw this painting assembled ever, not one time. Uh, you could have never imagined what it would have been like. So, um, I'm a little over my time, it's 12 minutes, so sorry. I was trying, <laughs> I was trying to keep it all uh, in 10 minutes, but I think that's probably good.
That's absolutely okay. That was really interesting. Um, and now I want to invite the members uh, to put questions in the chat box for q and I see we already have one in there, but I think um, I'd like to start with one other question um, that's been on my mind is Vernon Pratt, does he have a background in math? What is his background? What ignited this interest in creating works that are focused so much on mathematical formulas and theories? He did not have a background in math, and William, you, you yeah, no, he didn't. Well, but he um, he was very interested in math, and he was very interested in um, sort of a, a scientific, methodical approach. But as far as I know, he was not interested in math just on its own sake. Like William, do you have more on that? Yeah, no, I, I was going to say I, I think he was just really interested in the process of painting. Right. You know, people, I think there was a New York Times article that talked about his painting as almost being like a paint by numbers, you know, which is, you know, they, they weren't necessarily, you know, trash talking him. I think that they were trying to figure out like his system. And I think he thought of that as a compliment, right? Because he wanted everybody to see his process. It wasn't about being some great flashy artist. It was about you know, how the human mind works. And that's also, that's part of this whole systematic abstraction, you know, movement or some very small movement, but Solowit and others have, you know, have used that framework to say, you design a system, you apply the system, and that's the way you make the art. So it, it was, yeah, that's, that was his approach. It is interesting too, though, because he was a, he was a figurative painter originally. And he painted beautifully, you know, kind of like very similar-ish to like Deben Corn or, or James Weeks that he worked with out, out in California. And then he came to Duke and they hired him and he was there for a couple of years. And then he was actually, his daughter Amy was telling me the story. He got in a bicycle accident and he was in a coma, which interestingly enough, he died from another bike, a, a bicycle accident and fell into a coma and never awoke. But when he woke from the first coma, his personality ultimately ended up changing and actually caused some tension uh, with with some of his uh, with some of his um, children, where his personality changed a little bit, but also to his art changed tremendously. It went from being figurative to more abstract and mathematical, in particular. Interesting. Um, well, the next question came in from uh, Joey, uh, and he was asking if you could explain a little more about the fat square and um, eye movement. And if you need me to get some more information, I can, Joey, if you're comfortable with it, I can unmute you and you can explain a little further. But you, Marsha, you're shaking your head. You seem to understand. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, so Vernon, uh, this is a, uh, this painting is a progression. And it was actually true of many of his paintings that he used a very subtle rectangular proportion, five to six, Houston points out. Um, and so the, there's actually movement from a beginning to an end. And a square is a static form. So there's no, there's no sort of movement associated or, or instilled by in, a, in a square. And so th this was his way of creating a sense of subtle guiding your eye. Um, movement. And, and let me just add to that, you know, we have not seen as much of the work as William has intimately, but we've seen enough of it to know that a lot of Vernon's paintings are really experimenting with the slightest variation in color. Um, there's a gray series in particular I'm thinking of, and if you look at all the squares separately, these are squares that are each painted about this big, they look completely the same. If you put them in the progression, in the light, you can tell there's a dramatic difference between the first square and the last square. It's just a very subtle variation between, and that's the formula that William showed um, and talked about in the, in the journal um, entries and on the back of some of the paintings. I mean, that's really hinting at what happens if you add this very, very minor factor of variation. And then of course, all the possibilities of filling in 16 It's doing the, the extremes of black and white, but it's the same kind of principle of just doing it on this incredibly large scale. Yeah, it's, 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 it's interesting. The way I talk about Brennan Pratt's work, it's almost like the scene from Raiders of the Lost Ark when, when, uh, when Indiana Jones, Climbs into the uh, climbs into the map map room with his staff, and is yeah, on the right on the right day at the right hour was mm -hmm. uh, the, you will see this beam of light, and all of a sudden man, we have paintings in our house 
every single day I walk by him and I see something totally different. And it, it, the way that he set that up, where, whether it's in variations of color, whether it's small little scribbles that, that he knew were there and nobody else was likely ever going to see again, it's been pretty interesting to see. And I should point out, too, I, I know I talked about this a little bit in my presentation, but so when I talk about the painting is all the possibilities of filling in 16th, parentheses 65,536. Yes, they are all different, by the way. I saw somebody's question about that. We, we have confirmed that. But those are not those are not just possibilities. Those are also formulas for individual colors. Because basically, as we just talked about, the slightest hint of variation uh, in the way of this layering system basically creates scenarios where two panels next to one another look the exact same until you look at them in the right light and you realize they're one like a tenth of a shade off. Basically, it's Joseph Albert's dream. Great. And it looks like Barbara also mentioned that uh, some wineries in Napa have large art collections and probably large walls if you want to look into there. <laughs> yeah. um, one thing that you had mentioned, William, is, uh, and I apologize if the sound was a little off from the streaming, I think that's just the way it was streaming over the internet, but um, it, the music that was chosen for this film and Vernon's interest in music, it was that a very specific choice for this film? Are there mathematical concepts layered into that, the music that was playing alongside of it? Yeah, well, I'll start with that, although Lewis is the musician, so I'll let him take over the music part. But Rich Hawley, who did that composition, um, is the director of Arts NC State, and he's also um, a very talented composer and percussionist. And so he actually composed a much longer work that if you went to the exhibition, when it was open, you came into this room, you were surrounded on three sides, and then you mm -hmm. could hear Rich's entire composition, which I think is a little over two hours. Mm -hmm. And um, so when we uh, decided to do the project, we thought, okay, what a gift. There is this ready-made custom score that is based on Vernon's intellectual principles, um, as was the structure of our film. Um, let's start uh, trying to identify uh, the kind of uh, best best compositions uh, to use from this longer work for each chapter of the film. And so, um, you know, the, the, the score was made as, as our film was formalistically sort of echoing Vernon's ideas. And uh, sixteenths is a very important number in music, you know, that there's, um, six, you know, two, four, 16, that's the way, Kind of bars are divided and time signatures and so uh there and and of course music is very much a proportional system of mathematics in the same way so there is a very strong parallel and it and it we just felt really lucky that um rich had you know had written this piece that was perfect really for the film yeah i would i would echo that too i, I would just say well, I, I appreciated Rich's music at the uh, at the exhibit. I almost felt like sometimes it was really hard to experience the painting with all of that was going on. And but I really appreciated it and liked it. But for the film, it's absolutely perfect. It is just absolutely perfect for the film in particular. It helps describe the feeling of your mind kind of racing when you're standing in this basically inside Vernon's brain. Pretty interesting. Yeah, and let, I mean, the, the, the stagger that you all experienced watching this um, uh, got in the way of this somewhat, but let me also just take a minute to mention Kevin Wells, who was our editor, who teaches um, filmmaking and production at UNC Greensboro, did a really extraordinary job of helping us to create a sense of kind of musicality um, in terms of, of those image sequences where we go from small to big to from one square to four to 16 and so on. And, and having that tied to the music was really important to us. And I think Kevin just executed it really wonderfully. So. Absolutely. Great, well, thank you. Um, so one thing else is uh, the work is really interesting because it can cross barriers and appeal to folks of the scientific mindset and of the artistic mindset. So and I think it, this was mentioned either in the film or during your presentation, William, um, but it's a very different experience seeing it in the film than seeing it in person. So what are the general reactions that you've observed from people who did get to go and actually see it exhibited in full? 
It's funny. I've had some people just their mind is blown and they can be in there all day, right? It's like almost I talked about walking in the warehouse, like being in an Egyptian tomb, but it is almost you're surrounded by like hieroglyphs. It's really pretty interesting. It's community. It's a form of communication, right? Um, but I also know people who love Vernon Pratt and who have a lot of Vernon Pratt work who are in the warehouse and have helped us throughout this process. When they walked in the room, it gives them tremendous anxiety. It's really, it's people either love it or they're like, they're jumping out of their skin. It's really pretty interesting because I could sit in there all day, every day. Um, um, but I'm also super ADD and, and OCD and all these other types of disorders. So maybe that kind of says something about me. I'm not sure if Lewis or Marsha have. Well, other. for me, my experience of it was I found it very meditative and calming and um you know i was teaching a class i'm a professor at nc state i teach film studies and i was teaching a class a small seminar on outsiders in art and film and music that the semester it was up and so i brought my students and we all sat in the room and they were so moved by it it was really interesting to see it through their eyes and they had the fascination with walking up to it and seeing you know intimately the the, the marks on the, on the canvas and then stepping back and really kind of, you know, breathing it in. It had almost a vibrational quality to it um, mm -hmm. if you looked at it the right way and from the right perspective. There, it, it's a very painterly piece to be so mechanical in one sense and, and all about a process, but actually you can really sort of lavish your attention on a square and you can see where things have been corrected and there you know there's so much richness and 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 it's so different from different perspectives and you know i think about uh larry wheeler the former director of the north carolina museum of art he knew vernon's work and he was blown away i mean his the, what what he says in the film is very much was his reaction he just had no idea. It's like, wow, this is just astounding. You know, the magnitude and sort of the power of that piece. Well, and I think the other thing that's just worth mentioning is uh, one of the things I thought a lot about while we were making this film and while I was looking at the work is how it represents time. I mean, think about the amount of time that Vernon Pratt spent not just conceiving of this project, but executing it. I mean, we have the dates, we have, I mean, that's one thing to think about, but then the amount of time it took to do each canvas and the way, I mean, that it literally embodies a, a couple of years out of somebody's life, I think is a really interesting idea to think about in relationship to these ideas of time and math and formula and art and abstraction and representation. So I think it's a very special, piece in that way. I don't think there's many paintings that um, you could really compare it to. Yeah, I would I would also add, I should have added this earlier, that the people, I mean, obviously there are those of us that are super enthusiastic about this, but the, but the people I found that were most interested in it just purely from a sense of, created a sense of wonder were children. Like every, whenever I was at the, the, the ex exhibition hall, there were kids just, fascinated by it. I mean, they were fascinated. It was, you could spend hours in there. I had a, a parent tell me one time that if they ever needed to calm their kid down or get some energy out, they could just take them to the exhibit. And they would spend five hours running around trying to find all the different pieces and parts. Um, the painting itself was hung uh, 18 feet tall and 110 feet long in this particular instance. But that also allowed for an inch or two in between each panel. I, I did see somebody else's question. Right. Um, and Barbara actually followed up er on her earlier question asking, how did he figure out all the possibilities without repeating? And I'm sure there's a mathematical formula in that, but I suppose how on earth did he keep track of all of this over the course of, you know, years of his life, as you said, and um, just making sure that it was represented correctly? Well, William, you may you may have cracked the code, but uh, <laughs> out of out of as much time as we have spent studying this painting and studying Vernon's notebooks, and there is one part in a notebook where he describes, in in a way, he describes the process, but we never figured it out. The, I mean, there is clearly a way to move from one square to the next, and there is a progression. 
but we really never did crack exactly what his code is. Which is to say that we couldn't replicate it based on our knowledge of it oh, in terms right. of the formula. Right. But you also didn't see the painting in the way it was intended to, or 16 panels tall, 16 right. panels wide. So that's, you know, we, uh, there's a painting that I showed um, in kind of my presentation that's all the possibilities of filling in eights. Okay. There are the, there are at least eight different versions of this painting that I know of. Some are diagonal, some are horizontal, some are vertical. And so they're all the same painting. They all speak the same language, but the way that you're intended to read them is totally different. And so it's hard to say when you're, we're kind of, you know, we're still reading it, you know, from right to left, but we're also kind of breaking up that sequence. So it's, it's tough uh, without seeing it in person um, the way it was intended. And I do have to say, I, I hope so much that before I die, I will get to see this painting uh, up the way that it was intended on, on one wall. I mean, it really would be an incredible thing. So um, I'm, you know, as we say at the end of the documentary, um, the painting does not have a home outside of the care it's being given by the Vernon Pratt Project. So, um, so that remains to be determined. Yeah. If you guys know anybody with some giant walls, <laughs> let us know, we'll make it happen. Or, or some land where we could build some giant walls because I'm positive I could get some money for it. <laughs> well, along those lines, it, I know you're looking for a permanent home, but is there the opportunity that this might be exhibited again in a temporary space or Absolutely. on a smaller scale, even though I'm sure that would affect the integrity of the work as a whole? Absolutely. We would love, we would love the painting to travel. If nothing more than we're paying to store it currently, it would be really awesome for somebody else to be caretaking for it. Um, no, yeah, ab absolutely. We would love to find a, a situation where it could be viewed by others because it was never seen by anybody until it went up and it was only up for a couple of months and then it came back down. And I would argue it's one of the most important paintings in North Carolina history. And, you know, Larry Wheeler, his comments would argue it's probably one of the more important modernist abstraction paintings in, North, in, North, in American history. Um, it would be awesome for people to see it because it is something you really have to see to experience. And the documentary does an amazing job you know, putting you in an immersive experience, but it's still it's still a different reaction. Oh. I'm sure. Yeah. I mean, I would, I, and let me just add to that that you know William mentioned, like if anyone's got some land that we can get some money for. <laughs> um, I mean, I think this is a work that would be very well served by um, by a kind of Rothko Chapel. Um, Absolutely. Style exhibition. But cooler, much cooler than the Rothko Chapel. Much cooler, of course. <laughs> yeah. um, but I mean, I, I honestly, I think the work deserves it. I think North Carolina deserves it. I mean, this isn't a really important artist um, to, to the state. Um, and, I, and I think it has such a larger international significance that has yet to be realized. And so we'll see what happens, but it's my hope. Yeah, I would also say that the, this exhibit, I mean, I know that everybody was excited about the exhibit, but I don't think that, that anyone was prepared for the level of critical acclaim and enthusiasm about this. This is hands down by far and away the most successful exhibit the Greg Museum has ever had in almost 30 plus years of being in business. So it's, um, you know, I could see this being a resounding success wherever it goes, not just necessarily tied to North Carolina, but to Marsha's point, it's important, I think, for it to stay ultimately in North Carolina, but I just wanted to have a good home, basically. Of course. Well, one thing that occurred to me is uh, during the film, someone says that uh, one of the speakers says he wasn't so much interested in self-expression, but rather how the universe worked. Um, and I feel like some would argue that using these math mathematical qualities in his painting is a form of self-expression. And I just would wonder how you guys would respond to something like that. Well, I think, I think he, Vernon would say it was a form of self-expression. And I think what Roger was really saying was um, a expression, more like expressionism or expression as a emotional sort of revelation of the inner self or something. And I think Vernon's expressive ideas were more about rational and about revealing 
relationships and, and that his interests were you know, impersonal, really, right. I think. Yeah, not about psychology. It was yeah. about how to, um, how to understand the world in some ways by bringing it down to the level of, of the formula. Yeah, he even says that in his journal, right? He says impersonal, I'm personal. Like he's That's like right. he's a personal person, but his art is impersonal. And he understands that and accepts it and embraces it all art of it. Right. Well, and, and I, it's it can connect to everyone because everyone experiences math or science in their everyday life. So it's impersonal and yet everyone can relate in some way. Yeah, and it's universal and it's language, right? It's not right. tied to a specific culture. And and also, you know, the the quote that William just uh, just shared, along with what Houston says in the documentary, that I think, I mean, that's a hard thing to convey for something like this. But I mean, Vernon had, I think, a really wicked sense of humor, and so uh, he was witty. He liked word games. Uh, I think there's a lot of play um, in his work, especially, I mean, William, you, I'm sure you could throw up some slides from your collection that are illustrative of this, but um, but there's a sense of humor there that in some ways, I think when you look at, think about all the possibilities of filling in 16th, it doesn't seem to have a lot of that, except on the back of the paintings, right? All of those comments he makes, I mean, are hilarious. They're very different from what's on the front, which seems kind of serious, right? Black and white and this formula, but I don't think that that was his character. Yeah, I would, I would say there's a good one with the North Carolina education wall. There's, right in the center, it says, you are a child. You are suitable, suitable to be odd, like A-W-D, like, like odd. Like an awe. But he, uh, he actually meant that in a way. He liked playing with words, just like he liked playing with math. And he actually meant, you are a child. You are suitable, you are, you are suitable to be odd, O-D-D. So he wanted it to be read in different ways and constantly be playing with uh, the, the reader and there's actually that piece of art actually has braille on it and when you go to try and read the inscription it says so if you want to know what this says find a blind person to tell you it won't it won't it won't uh translate it for you great Which i always thought was really fantastic <laughs> that's wonderful <laughs> um so it looks like we don't have any more questions from the audience, but one thing I would love to end on is, as you mentioned, William, we have two of Vernon's works in our collection. Um, and I'm happy to pull up the images that you sent me, though I think yours are probably far superior, the ones you showed in your presentation. And our curatorial team has yet to be able to exhibit these. And I know that they're looking for kind of a great context um, for exhibiting these works. So I wonder if you could just share some information about those pieces that perhaps could inspire them and also just help our members learn a little bit more about these two works that are in our collection. Yeah. Um, oh, that didn't work. <laughs> oh, right there. So <laughs> this is a, called Four Eights. Um, it's, a, it's a mentioned before, it's one of, Vernon's major, um, all the possibilities paintings is all the possibilities of four into eight. So it, it is in itself, it's a mathematical, it's a mathematical equation, but it's also specifically a work focused on color theory and colors. And I think it's important for a collection of such as your own, um, your connections to Alvarez and the Black Mountain College. I think I would argue that this painting sh should be prominently displayed. Um, it's I want to say it's nine feet tall or nine feet long, nine or ten feet long and eight feet tall. Um, and then uh, the Falling Light Corrected was actually um, one of the main, it was the centerpiece for his North Carolina Museum of Art solo show. Um, and it's where he really kind of dealt and in, delved into sculpture as well as painting. So it's a gradient, but also too, there's pretty interesting things like you can kind of start to make it out here right in this eye in the heart of the plywood there's an Egyptian eye uh, which I didn't know until I saw this for the 300th time and I saw it on the right day and I noticed it so it's um and this is a floor piece but it was hanging on our wall at our house for a while so there's, there's lots of lots of pretty interesting things you could do with it but I would, uh, both of these have been totally restored. Uh, they were featured in the, the Western Carolina Museum Grids and Gradient show. And I would, I would encourage you all uh, to display them because I, I would, I think as people now are beginning to find out, Vernon was a well-known artist when he was alive, but when he died, the world kind of forgot about him. I think he was, 
could dive right. It's just the internet was really becoming super commonplace and his work was really, you know, nobody was doing 40 foot, no, nobody cared about modern art in Durham or, or in North Carolina, really, frankly, when he was doing this stuff. And uh, I feel like if he had been in New York or LA, he would have had a much more successful career, but he, he intentionally chose to stay in North Carolina. So when he died, the world just kind of forgot about him. And now they're start, it, people are starting to, through the work of efforts like Marshall and Lewis and others, are really starting to kind of get wind of this work and understand just how important and special it is. And I would argue that you have two incredibly powerful pieces. And I'd love to see them exhibited if possible. Um, yeah. Perfect. Well, thank you, all three of you. This was fascinating and wonderful. Thank you for making this documentary and sharing it with us today. Um, I hope that all of us go out and learn a little bit more about Vernon. I have to be honest that before this documentary was brought to my attention, I didn't know much about Vernon Pratt either, um, but his work is really unique and um, I definitely will plan to seek him out in other museums when we can travel again and hopefully we can find a way to display his work in the Asheville Art Museum very soon. Um, so thank you. This was wonderful and a perfect way to end our member programs for the year on such a high note. Um, I also want to thank all of our members for joining us today. Um, I hope we will see you again in the new year. Um, um, our next member program won't be until sometime in January, so just stay tuned for an email from us sometime after the new year, um, and I'll send out our program evaluation in a little bit. I hope you all can fill it out. It'll only take a few minutes of your time, and I hope you all stay well. Happy holidays, and uh, we'll see you soon. Can I put in one quick plug? And of the course. off chance that you ever decide you want to do your own Vernon Pratt show, whether it's this painting or not, let me know. We've got some cool stuff that would be Great. awesome. It would look awesome on those beautiful new walls. Perfect. And actually, one last question, Lewis and Marsha. Um, this film is not yet available for everyone to view, which is why we're going to be removing it from re the recording. When will it be? Just for those who might tune into this member recording later and are interested in seeing it down the line. That's a great question. So it, um, so it's been on the film festival circuit. It has two more festival screenings that I'm aware of so far. They're festivals that got pushed to spring with the hope they could be face to face. We'll see. Um, and then after that, we are not sure what the distribution outlet will be, but um, it will certainly, I would think, by at the latest, the middle of the year, be available in some streaming form. And so if you Google, um, I, I teach at NC State, I have a website and I have links to everything. Um, I will put up links as soon as we have it um, available to view. Perfect. Well, I, I'm happy if it's the all the possibilities website that you had shared with me previously, yes. I'm happy to send that out with the Great. evaluation so everyone has that and can stay tuned for more details. But thank you again and stay well, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you. Bye.